When you make wine sparkling in champagne or by the champagne method, you start with a big tank of dry wine. When I say dry wine, it has no sugar. There's no sugar. It's dry. Dry, dry, dry wine. It could be a tank of wine that's five years old um, and has matured in the tank nicely. Or some of it maybe have been previously in barrels and then gone into the tank. But it's dry, still tranquil wine, okay? You start there. You know the volume you have. Say you have a 40 hectoliter tank. So you know it with 40 hectoliters you need to add a particular volume mass of sugar and yeast to that wine. Okay, so say it, I pull the numbers out of my head, but you have 40 hectoliters, you need 8 kilograms of sugar with yeast to add to the wine. You mix it in, it all gets mixed, and you bottle that tank of wine immediately. Are you following me? So you bottle the tank of wine immediately, and what happens? The sugar that you added to that dry wine in the presence of the yeast that you added ferments. But it's in the bottle now. It's already stuck. So the gas that's produced, the carbon dioxide, has no place to go. So it goes in solution. Okay? That's the first part. So the bottles are filled up. They're fermenting. They're, they're put on their side, and they're stored in champagne. It's a minimum of 18 months. Uh, but in many places, it's much longer. So here it's two years. So, uh, and this is Burgundy. Um, so what happens is that fermentation very slowly completes. Very slowly, all that uh, uh, sugar is fermented into a tiny bit of alcohol and lots of carbon dioxide going in solution. But the other product of the fermentation, it's a natural product of, of the fermentation of wine, is the sediment. So it's dead yeast cells, it's potassium by by, by tartrate crystals. It's all the junk that falls out of solution when wine is made. Um, if you look in barrels, uh, sometimes they call it Weinstein. It can look like crystals. In a bottle of sparkling wine that's been sitting for two years, if you pick it up like this and move it around, and set it, what you'll see is nasty, slimy, stringy stuff floating around, and it's also insect parts it looks like, and crushed glass uh, uh, stuff floating around. Obviously you can't sell the bottle of wine that way, right? Um, so so, so they're, they're stored very carefully like this. Problem is you have to get that sediment out of the bottle, or you have to sell a bottle that has that is clean, right? That doesn't have the sediment in it. Naturally, if it's sat for a couple of years, that sediment falls down here and actually gets fused to the glass. It's really stuck there. So you would imagine, well, the easy thing to do would be to open the bottles carefully and decant the wine cleanly, leaving that sediment attached to the glass in the bottle, right? Wouldn't that be natural? Sure, but in Metaux Champenoise, you don't do it that way. In Metaux Champenoise, you decant out the sediment without disturbing the wine in the bottle and leaving the wine in that original bottle. The crux of Metaux Champenoise is that the wine is sold in exactly the same bottle in which the second fermentation took place without the wine ever having left it. Okay, so here's the magic part of it. The bottles are collected then from the side and they're put into racks. See how they are located here in racks? Uh, nose first in an angled okay. rack, okay? So they're put in there, and this is pretty late in the, uh, in the uh, uh, riddling process. They go in racks like this, columns and rows, lots and lots of them. You may set up your poupee, but maybe longer than this room if you have the space in, in the cellar. I've seen it that long at uh, Katzenberger, for example. Um, and then uh, you, you, if you have that all set up, all, the, all those bottles set up there, you get a bucket of paint, white paint, a whitewash, a brush, and you go and you nick all the bottles. So in a column. So you nick, 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 nick. So every bottle has a white spot at six o'clock position. Okay? See that? Then you come by and you and you come by and in passing you grab the grab two bottles, adjacent bottles, or sometimes there's one in between, the technique varies. Um, one in between and then you move alternating in between between. But you grab two bottles and the first thing you do, you eighth of a turn to the left and drop them back in the rack and you go through and you do the whole thing, the whole long pupitre of that, thousands of bottles maybe, you turn them one eighth of a turn the other. Then you pass again the next time and you go a quarter turn to the right. So you go from eight o'clock to four o'clock to eight o'clock to four o'clock to eight o'clock, passing over it over the course of 10 or 15 days, usually short, shorter than 15 days. And at the same time, they're, they're, the, the wines are being turned like that. 
the rack, you can see, is starts out relatively horizontal. The rack is adjustable so that the bottles become uh, more vertical. So at the end of the racking period, or if, say you could see a, a high-speed uh, time-lapse uh, image of this uh, process, the bottle is going like this. Okay, what's happening? It loosens the sediment from the glass. The sediment slides to the crown cap. So it's a beer bottle cap, typically. Okay, so the sediment gets right there against the uh, crown cap. The bottle then goes into a conveyor in, in this position, with the sediment, and the, and the conveyor takes the bottles, one after the other, going through the neck of the bottle submerged in a brine slush, which is actually colder than the freezing point of the wine in the neck of the bottle. So all of that? So it moves slowly down this conveyor in this briny slush, which is so cold that the wine in the neck of the bottle actually freezes into a bullet plug. The bottle comes down the conveyor. It's turned. Everything is nice. The crown cap is taken off. And the pressure inside the bottle pushes out this bullet of ice. It's ice, but the ice contains the sediment. So without disturbing in any way the wine in the original bottle in which it was second fermentation took place, the, the sediment has been removed. What does that leave you? An open bottle of wine. This, this one's going to explode if I open that one. <laughs> An open bottle of wine that has um, an airspace at the top. There's, there's, it needs to be topped up. So the bottle moves down the conveyor now it's upright, moves down the conveyor, and it arrives at a place where it stops briefly for a, a second and moves on. And when it stops there, above it is a stainless steel funnel with a valve and so on. And then it, it just delivers whoop, right enough of what is called the dosage to top the bottle up. Okay. So the dosage is normally in Champagne, for Louis Roder at Cristal, for Dom Perignon, for all the places in the world where sparkling wine is made by this method. The dosage is normally the same wine, but mixed with some sugar. And the reason is that the sugar, not to ferment again, because there's no yeast, sterile condition, the sugar is to round out the flavors. Many, many sparkling wines made by this method without any dosage whatsoever, would make your teeth hurt to drink them um, with the acidity and the, and the hardness and the toughness of the, of the wine. So it's not to make the wine sweet, but it's to round flavors together and help them marry together. So that dosage goes there, the cork goes in, and then the bottles rest again for a few months before they're sold, okay, so that the, the flavors all marry together, the wine settles, it's been traumatized, and so on and on. So that dosage is very important, very important thing. Here's what's special about this wine. This wine is made all that way in as much handcrafting as can possibly be done. Plus the fruit is biodynamically farmed. Very special uh, uh, vineyards. Great, great producer of, of uh, uh, white burgundy. But the dosage is not the same wine mixed with sugar. The dosage is this wine in the 1996 vintage. So the wine is 2011. But when the bottle arrives at that stage, under the stainless steel uh, uh, delivery device of the dosage before it's corked, here's Aurelien Calte, this kid, is cranking bottles of 1996 Botrytis affected, super sweet wine from the same vineyards that this came from. Something that arrives only once in 30 years then. Uh, extreme rarity. Of incredibly special rarity that it's so rare that in Burgundy when it happens the gift of Botrytis affected Chardonnay in this area they really don't know what to do with it there's no component of Burgundy culture that says drink this and so um, when he decided to make this sparkling wine in 2006 and it was to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Andre Bonhomme's uh, uh, establishment of the estate as an estate bottling uh, entity Andre was the first to leave the negociant so his father sold the wine to Louis Jadot for Macon Village. So he decided when he was a kid in 1956, like, we have the best wine. Why don't we bottle it instead and not have it used to make the other acceptable? Um, so um, anyway, to celebrate the 50th anniversary, he decided to start making Cremant of this nature. And he looks in the cellar and he says, man, 1996, we made so much of this uh, Succès d'Automne. 
this uh, this sweet wine. Why not uh, try this and uh, and 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 dos, uh, do the dosage of the the wine with this? Every succeeding vintage, he uses the 1996 for that, and that's like a, a, this wine is a miracle of nature. The 96, uh, uh, even more miraculous, more concentrated. Uh, um, so this is this is positively unique kind of wine. And then at the end of the day, all of that told to you to reflect on. Um, uh, on the fact that it costs less than half the price of entry-level champagne. True champagne from champagne must be better, right? Because it's true champagne. Well, most entry-level brut true champagnes from the big houses are garbage. Frankly, they genuinely are. They're overcropped, they come from everywhere, they're fixed up. The dosage, actually, if they tell you about blending together all these uh, special cuvées that, that the little old tasters are, are, are finely tuning a house style. House style is made by the flavorance in the uh, dosage. Now you know what the dosage is. <coughs> the house wine is really made by what secret flavorance you put in there. Especially you buy wine already bottled in a cooperative and all you have to do is disgorge it and top it up. Huh. It's, it's legal. It's perfectly legal. It's rampant fraud that's legal in Champagne and regularly practiced, especially for the entry-level brutes. What are the entry-level brutes? You know what they are. Mums Cordon Rouge, Moët et Chandon, uh, extra uh, uh, white star, uh, Vauclico yellow label made by a, a luggage company, a million cases a year. Um, here you have 1,200 cases twice a year by a, a passion farmer and crafted by hand, human infusion that is, uh, is, is, is wonderful. And it's less than half the price, why? No four color and an architectural digest with the pretty girl and the red ribbon on her back. You know, no marketing, no marketing expenses. That's what you pay for when you buy the, the when you buy the image of luxury of true champagne. You can't call it if you, it's got champagne. Then it's just sparkling wine. You can't really, you know, it's just sparkling wine. This is not just sparkling wine. This is Cremant de Bourgogne of great pedigree, miracle of nature and craft. I think.